Hello and welcome to my bench. I'm Jerry Livings and uh, today we are going to be sizing a engagement ring. A friend of mine was recently engaged and her ring is just a little bit too big. So I am taking this opportunity away from the normal videos I'm doing of basic uh, work to show you what the process is of a normal job that you would take in as a bench jeweler. Uh, now remember that this is one job, so nor, during the course of a day you might be doing anywhere from 40 to 60 ring sizings. Uh, it can get quite busy. So I'm going to show you the different steps and the different processes. <sighs> Excuse me. Uh, and uh, we'll start by showing you a little bit of the job envelope. Okay, what you want to do is, for one, you want to have their information all at the top, which I'm blocking so you can't see it. Uh, and then you're going to have a description of the item, uh, the date received, instructions. This one is very simple. It says size down to four, uh, four and a half. Uh, and then at the bottom I have uh, stamped 14K NYC. Those are the stampings in the ring. Oh, and this item is a white gold solitaire with an oval blue stone. And you never say, uh, when you're taking in a job envelope, you know, that it's a sapphire or a diamond or a ruby or a garnet. Because if somebody uh, gets a ring back and sees that you wrote on the envelope, it's a diamond and it was really a CZ or a white topaz or it was a, a blue topaz and you know, and they're going to turn around and be like where's my sapphire, where's my diamond and now you are stuck with it so always just describe the stone okay? Um, and also any stampings on the inside as I said earlier, a lot of times uh, you will have 20, 30, 40 rings out at once in containers as you're going through the steps of doing them all at once. You'll be like size down, size down, size down, uh, you know, bend the shanks together, put those in a tray, move those over here for the next step, uh, and you, it's really assembly line. Uh, this one in particular, I did note that it has, uh, I did a sketch real quick, and I did note that it has hollow shoulders, uh, which is important to know. Okay, now uh, when I say the shoulders, this is the ring. The shoulders are this little portion right up here, the top of the ring, near the setting. So it's the shoulder of the ring. Uh, this is a slightly tapered solitaire, but not by much. And uh, uh, the hollow, the hollowed taper stops there and there. So about the bottom one fifth or one sixth of this ring is where you can size it. So first we put that there. Uh, put this back in here. Job envelope goes over here, nice and safe. And I'm going to turn this off and get a good view of the bench, okay? See you in a moment. Okay, welcome back to my bench. We're ready to size the ring. Uh, uh, we'll start. First, you get the ring out and make sure that it's the ring that you actually are going to work on because you do not want to size the wrong ring. Uh, important, you want to have a mandrel that is accurate. Uh, if you're sizing rings, uh, make sure you invest in a high quality mandrel that's very accurate. Uh, not one of those cheap ones, they tend to be very inaccurate uh, and can change. They might be accurate in one spot, but they can change along the length. Make sure that you're getting an accurate mandrel. Uh, for my uh, for the people that I worked with, I actually supplied mandrels to them that were identical to the ones I have here so they could size. So I know that the mandrel they were using was the same. And that makes, uh, makes it a lot easier when people get their ring back and go, well, this is still a quarter size off. So you want to make sure you have a good mandrel that sizes well. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look here, we're going to slide this on. Uh, that's about 
a five and three quarters. Slide it on the other direction, and it's a little over five and three quarters. Okay. Now what this is telling me is the jeweler who rounded this out uh, had the ring on here in this direction, and he rounded it out and up a little past five and three quarters. He, what you should do is go up here, uh, tap the ring, and then uh, turn it over and tap it. So it should read the same uh, both ways. Okay, so the jeweler who did this wasn't uh, minding his P's and Q's very well. You should be able to flip that over and it reads the same both ways. Okay, so we know it's a five and three quarters. So you write that down, five and three quarters, and then arrow down to uh, four and one half. Okay, so we're going down one and a quarter sizes. Okay, now you can figure that out with a micrometer and you'll have a list of all the sizes you need and you know what the radiuses and diameters are and all that and try and figure it out. Or you can do what most jewelers do. They have a uh, ring set for sizing. Okay. So we're going down one and. Okay. Okay, but these are spring steel. Uh, we're going down one and a quarter sizes. So I picked the one here that says one and a quarter. Okay. And I know that the space between these two points. Is one and a quarter sizes. So what we do is we lay this right here, just right up there. Up and where's my magnification? I want to make sure this is magnified. Lay this right up there. Find the center section, and I can actually see the solder joint. The other guy did was bumped up. So I want to get on either side of that. And then just go and push down and kind of snap it. Okay, uh, I got it on there and it kind of slid off a couple of times, but uh, I'm going to have two decent marks right there, and that's a little off center. This mark is way too centered. So let's do this again. But on this side. We're going to do this right here. Okay. We have my marks. Put them back on there. Pull out your. Okay. Now, uh, this is a, a bench pin. Okay. Now, this is a specialized bench pin. This has a brass fitting and a little hook in it. And this is designed for boom, boom, sizing rings. Uh, makes life easier. Now, one thing to remember is I'm going to draw a little picture here for you. If you're sizing rings, okay, okay, the space between these marks I put on the shank right here, this is the ring shank, and this is what we will be removing. Okay, I put a little mark there and there on the shank to show me where to cut. Okay, uh, now when we're removing. Uh, a piece we want to cut on the outside so you're sh okay just on the outside that's where the kerf of your here, can I, can I look at the camera trying to get this up there this is where the kerf of your saw is going to be it's on the outside of those rings now if you were adding in a piece it's simple uh, you would just cut in the middle and spread it and 
uh, put a piece in uh, to the right size you needed. That's a lot easier. Uh, <coughs> but uh, you want to make sure because if you take off too little when you size the ring, it's going to be too big. You know, and you want to make sure that you do remove that material. But if you're using a really wide blade, which this one is kind of, I'm going to move to a slightly smaller blade size. I'm sizing rings, and I just got blades everywhere. When I'm sizing rings, I like to use a smaller blade size. Yes, I do take and break more of them more often, but it, that's just part of the game. Because the reason for that is I'm removing less of the customer's gold. And you want to make sure that you don't remove too much of the gold. Find the way this goes. Yep. Okay, now that's uh, the part about removing. So what I want to do is I'm going to very carefully line my saw blade up just um, that mark just to the outside of it. Very lightly cut there, and that's one piece gone. This over here. Okay. So gold goes into the tray. Now I'm going to try and hold this up for you with some tweezers. Okay. See that? Here, let's put it between there. Okay. That little, uh, right there. That little piece right in there. That's all we removed. That's one and a quarter sizes. Now, depending on your customer and where you work, you can either put that into scrap and just recycle it because it's worth only a few pennies, or the customer customer may want it back. So, uh, I just as most places assume that you're going to keep the scrap as part of the sizing. It's not worth getting back to the customer. Like I said, it literally is a few cents. So, we put this back. Now we're going to grab something called ring bending pliers, which have a very uh, faint curve to them. And we're going to just very, very lightly. Add a little pressure. I mean, it doesn't take much at all. So if you like crank, you're gonna really ruin the ring. So, and I'm taking my time because uh, I want to make sure this is perfect for. Okay. have is where it's almost touching so what you want to do is you want to take a oops, that's not an equalizing file where's my flat little equalizing file if I can find it uh, well this one will have to do uh, 
normally I have a little file that's flat on both sides. You just take and go here and you just very slightly pull on the ring so it spreads out a little bit. And you file the burrs off. are off that's kind of lined up so now you should be able to just use your fingers to size the rest now remember white gold has nickel in it so it tends to work hard and it tends to get a little bit of spring that you don't want so you have to make sure that these are very close. And you'd be amazed. You should be able to run your finger across there and barely feel anything. Should be pretty close to perfect. Then you pull your visor off, you look at it with your loop. And make sure that it's joined, there's no real gaps, and there's a little bit of a gap. So I want to bone the ring a little bit like that. Oops, too much. Come on. And this usually goes quicker, but the hollow shoulders uh, tends to make this very springy. So there we go. That's together and uniform. Well, what I'm doing is I'm looking at this against the wall, so because it's magnified, the whole background is kind of blurry. So I'm really seeing basically just the ring. And I'm able to tell that everything is fairly well lined up. Okay. Then I'm just going to put, slide it on here. loose so once it's rounded up it should be right at the size I want and now we put this down and we go over to the uh, uh, soldering bench see you there in a minute okay welcome back we are uh, getting ready to solder it's real easy on a ring like this just move this out of the way. You just have a uh, uh, gripping tweezers. Put that in there. And uh, some people will use borax and other stuff. Uh, I tend, because I use a little torch, to just use the flux. Okay. You cut a very small piece of white gold solder. This is a 14 karat white gold solder. And then, because I don't do this very often, I'm going to put my solder away right away so I don't mix it up with my silver, which is what I've been using mostly lately. So we go over here. Okay. 
Okay. A little solder, a little flux. There we go. Oops, uh, These are receivers. We pull that off. We look to make sure that everything's soldered through fine. Make sure that's cool. And then you drop that into your pickle pot. And that's the soldering. Uh, the next stop will be back at the bench. We'll see you back there. Okay. <coughs> we have soldered the ring. It's sat in the pickle pot for a few minutes. And um, I should explain the pickle. Uh, is a basically a very light acid solution that will uh, dissolve the uh, flux that melted onto here. So the little liquid I put on and dried up to help the solder flow uh, that creates a type of glass almost that prevents oxygen from getting in there. So uh, the pickle will help dissolve that and help clean off any impurities and take any oxygen uh, out of the surface and stuff so it's easier to clean. So basically it gets rid of rust. Uh, it's a very, very light acid solution. So I've uh, got the ring here. I can see my solder. I can see that the solder flowed through the joint very nicely on both sides. Nothing shifted, which is very nice. Okay, so the next step is to grab a, oops, that's too, too coarse. Grab my uh, file for the inside of rings. This is a number four, number four half round file. Uh, can you see that there? Yeah, number four half round. Uh, I'm a little strange. I label all mine so I can spot them easier. Uh, then what you do is you just put this here in this kind of convenient spot to put this. And then you just very lightly. File the inside a little bit. Now it sounds like I'm like with a file filing both ways. I'm only applying pressure uh, when I'm going forward and I'm just kind of letting it slide back, okay? Because uh, I shouldn't be doing that technically because I can still load up your file a little bit with uh, refuse, but it's not that bad. It's That's one of the bad habits. Don't do that. Do as I say, not as I do, okay? Uh, so now I have the inside smooth. So what I do is I take and I put it on the ring mandrel and right at right at four and a half there. So what you do is you grab your handy dandy little rawhide mallet. Some jewelers are good enough to keep it in round the entire time. I've only met a couple of them. Uh, most of the jewelers I know have to do this because they're never going to get it perfect the first try. Okay, so that's really, really close. So we put that back, we put this back. Now, uh, put the file back. Uh, this is where we use a different file. This is called a barrette file. Why, I don't know. It's just the shape of it. 
uh, if you find out, email me. I'd love to know why a Brett file is called a Brett file. Okay. Then what you do is where these areas of solder are a little bumped up, uh, what you want to do is knock those off. So you just want to very carefully flatten that out. This one is barely done. Okay, that's the side. Now with the top. Now if you notice, as I'm filing, I'm just using the edge of the file on the shank and it's right up against my thumb and I'm kind of rolling a little bit as I'm filing. That, that helps prevent flat spots. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the excess solder off the outside of the ring. too much. Oh, and the uh, file I'm using, it's a Brett, but it's a number four also. So it leaves very, very little marks. There's a little bit of bite there. So what you're looking for is, let me put this thing back, you want the shank to be generally about the same width and about the same depth, okay? Uh, I have to get my paper back here. Okay. Actually, this will work. Now we've taken this, uh, let's use a new piece, okay. okay. We've sized our shank, okay, it's there and here's the solder that's run through the meat. Okay, so we've taken off here and here. So now this is fairly smooth, okay? Uh, now what we want to do is we want to make sure that this stays about the same size. You don't want to grind this to where it's, you know, got a divot there and a divot here. Because all of a sudden you've got a very, very thin spot and that's where it's going to break. And it's very obvious that you took away too much metal. So you want to make sure this line here stays as uniform as possible, okay? Now, sometimes that's not possible when you're sizing down a ring, so you actually have to do a, a quarter shank. So instead of just sizing it down, you have to take off a whole section uh, to where you can get to a wide enough piece of gold to actually work. Uh, but now, on the when you're looking at the back of the shank, just just like here, uh, most solitaire shanks will be fairly straight when you size them, okay? Even though this one does taper, the taper quits, you know, about two-thirds of the way down the shank. So when you size it, you've got your seam here, and you're, again, your uh, solder has bumped out just a little bit where your seam is. So you file, 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 take that away. Now, again, you want to try and keep your shank straight okay you don't want it to like you don't want to file it to where it's kind of got a bow in there again 
because again that's a weak spot so this combined with too aggressive filing up here you know uh, you're going to end up with a shank that's you know a lot smaller and it's going to be very weak you don't, you don't want that so you want just you're looking for very uniform lines uh, you don't want it to be obvious that it you know, sucks in and, and you remove too much uh, that's a mark of a bad jeweler so, so uh, at this point we get out the good old um, uh, sand and stuff uh, flex shaft uh, these are little sanding discs which I love to use this one is a medium grit it, it, you can just feel a little bit of grit on there which isn't much okay and flip it oops I hope to get this in there correctly okay so now what you're going to do is you're just going to very lightly use this on the sides file marks that you want to have this. and the grid is on the inside that's why you see me coming down like this some people like it like to use these as a pen and work that way uh, your choice six and one half dozen of the other so but uh, yeah so what I'm doing is literally I don't know okay, that's gone. Now we put that down. We've we have removed the file marks. So now we take this little sandpaper sandpaper piece off. Now this is basically the same thing as a sanding stick, but a lot faster. Okay, and that is too coarse. What we want is. one something in between the two that I have and I'm looking 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 and I am not seeing one that's not that one let me go check my other batch uh, my student and oh there it is That's the one I wanted. This is a uh, this is a rubber crate X wheel, uh, and the one I had earlier was just a bigger one. Oh, yeah, this is a bigger version. They come about that size, and they gradually wear down. But uh, they come in all kinds of different grits, just like sandpaper. And that one was fairly aggressive. Uh, this one is, it kind of looks the same, but it's actually a different color. Um, depending on your manufacturer, they will uh, color code them for the different grits, so it's easier to keep track of them. But the manufacturers don't use the same thing, so try to use uh, uh, these from one manufacturer if you can. That way you can keep track of what's what. So...
happens more often than you want. Hope that never happens very often. You hear that little tick, tick, tick? Literally, this got knocked out of my hands, which happens because you're holding it very lightly. And it fell and hit in the tray and bounced up and literally found that one little spot between my lab coat and the edge of the tray and went right down to right down my stomach to the floor so it happens Okay. Now what I'm doing there is uh, on the inside of the shank I'm smoothing that and I'm trying to get out all the marks from the files. You have to be really careful because you can very easily wear a flat spot. And you can see the spot where the solder joint is. What you want to do is you want to round that off a little bit. Because your shank is flat on the bottom when it comes together. It's never going to come together perfectly. It's always going to be very slightly off by a fraction of a millimeter. It's just nature of the beast. So what will happen is on the inside shank there you'll have like this little divot just where the uh, metal joins. And you want to just round that off just very slightly. But if you get too aggressive then, well, it's too aggressive and then you remove too much metal and now your ring is way too big. So and this is right at four and a half both directions okay I'm going to make sure that's up there spin it a couple times make sure it's round okay got your ring clamp put this in there use oops oh no that's got that's got pitch on it I'm not going to use that. Okay. Use something with a very fine point. And you just touch it to the edge of the stone. Okay. Now you probably can't see it, but. When you're looking to see if a stone is loose after you've sized it, when you size the ring down, you're almost always going to have to tighten the stone. If you're not looking to see if the stone itself is moving, that's too hard to do. Okay, uh, It's really tough to see if a stone moves. I can do this all day and that stone looks like it's in place because you can't see anything. You, uh, sometimes you can hear it. And you can hear it rattle, but not always. So what you do is you use your light and you find a facet, you, like some of these little side facets. You get the light to reflect off of those, and then you just touch the girdle. And you can see the light change on the facets. You know, some will flash and some will turn dark and as the stone moves. So uh, that's telling you right there that the stone is loose, which is expected because, well, hey, this is a uh, this is a ring sizing. So now, uh, what I use for tightening stones? This is white gold. So you want to look and see the quality of the stone fittings settings. And the guy who did this did a good job, so. Okay. Got more.
almost too tight. So you take your ring, put it up in the ring setting like this in the ring holder uh, where um, it's held at the bottom of the shank. Then you take your setting pliers, which are, where are my setting pliers? Uh, right here. These are also called goose beak pliers because they kind of look like a goose beaks. Okay. And just put this here. Alternate your prongs. You're not using a lot of force. Uh, even white gold being as uh, stiff as it is because of the nickel content, uh, it still bends very easily. Uh, the copper and the nickel in here um, makes this a little tougher, but barely. Remember, gold is only about as tough as your fingernail. You can scratch it with your fingernail. Where's my I was using? And the stone is now tight. Now I decided that instead of uh, going over to my big polishing unit, it's one ring, I'm just going to polish it here. So, uh, because the top looks great. So I don't really need to do anything else. So I'm going to go start with a a crate X that's a lot finer than the one I used. It's this one, you can feel the grit in it. It's It feels like a pencil eraser. It actually feels smoother than a pencil eraser. No, this won't fit in the inside, so this is just for the outside. file marks. So I'm going to move to a small buff, small felt buff, and put some triply on it. polish will break down as you're using it. The uh, polish will break down the smaller, smaller, smaller fine bits. So you're, you should need to replace it at some point, but this is uh, doing pretty good. I think I'll be fine. This is the inside ring that you pop the inside of the piece. Now, I've gotten the area where I sized it all polished. What I want to do is go over the shoulders because uh, remember when you use those pliers to round this and shape it a little bit at the very beginning I want to remove any marks that might have been left from that
Just quick light little polish to the prongs. And you want to make sure everything is a okay and looking good. I'm not sure what that mark is. A little mark, it might be an imperfection in the casting. So I guess we are going over to the big polisher. Just to be on the safe side. Okay. Won't show that because it's boring and it'll be 30 seconds. So we will meet over at the cleaning sec section by the sink. Okay, welcome to the other part of my shop, uh, the corner with the sink and the ultrasonic and the steamer. Uh, what we've done is we've polished the ring, uh, made sure all the marks are out, uh, got it really nice and clean, uh, made sure the stone was tight. Now we're going to put it in the ultrasonic for a couple of minutes. And what this does is it heats up the water quite a bit. Uh, it's got a uh, clean solution in there. And we're going to hit a button here. Now what this does is it uses ultrasonic sound waves to get in there and it literally shakes the dirt out of all the places that you can't even reach with a brush. It just comes out in like a little cloud. Uh, you can see it right there. Just poof, coming right off. Uh, the cleaning solution will attack uh, oily base dirt and just, you know, general dirt. Uh, so it works really well. Some people will put a little bit of a ammonia in there. That works fine too. So, uh, you do want to use a solution made for ultrasonics uh, because you do not want this to uh, get kind of gummy. Now if you use something like this, uh, Dawn, that's great if you're just hand cleaning jewelry. It's very, very uh, gentle. Uh, and then sometimes I'll use just like a little touch of Mr. Clean uh, for stuff that's really gunked up. You know, all kinds of things. Uh, but if you put the Dawn in the ultrasonic, what happens is it kind of almost turns to like a jelly after a while. It's, it's really hard to get off of your own jewelry. And it's because it's not designed to be in the presence of ultrasonic waves for tons and tons of time. So, okay. So, pretty much all the birds already come off of that. It doesn't take long. So, uh, what you want to do is you want to get in there with a uh, toothbrush. And you want to get some of the dirt off your fingers, too. So, and you want to do this in the ultrasonic. Ooh, that's hot. Because uh, there is that little bit of precious metal stuck to your fingers from the polishing. So you want to make sure that gets that into the facade. Because you're not going to just throw this water down the drain. You're going to empty it into something and you're going to let it settle. And you're going to get all the particulates. And you're going to send that sludge to your refiner. You'd be amazed at how much money it's worth. Especially today's market is silver. So, then you pull the ring out. You clean it very carefully. You don't need this on anymore. Just reach in there and you get everything cleaned up. That's it. So it's still tight. Now you use your uh, tweezers with here and you steam it. This is going to be loud. There you go. That is done. Now we go back over to the bench. Uh, all we have to do is make sure the stone's still tight, make sure that there's no scratches that we have to repolish out. And we put it back in the envelope. There you go. One ring sizing.